Hey, good morning. Let's stand and worship together. Lift your voice. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord? question, right? It's a statement. It's a truth. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 good to be in the Lord's house. Wouldn't you agree? And uh, we w- want to welcome everyone to our services today. Those of you who are here, those of you who are watching online, worshiping with us on YouTube, we're grateful for you as well. Uh, we want to make sure that we uh, get some information to those of you who are our guests, uh, both here and online. And you can do that by connecting with us uh, through the Connect tab on our app, or you can just uh, uh, take a picture of the QR code that's in front of you in the pew. That'll take you right to it. Our app's free for you to download. So we encourage you to do that. Lots of good stuff on the app, and it's all free. And so we encourage you to take advantage of that uh, if if you're watching or if you're here uh, in our audience today. But we're uh, thankful that you're here. We have a gift that we'd like to give you if you're here with us uh, this morning for the first time. Stop by the Connection Center on your way out. Our pastor will be there. We'd love to give you that gift 
uh, for coming and worshiping with us today. Uh, I just have a few things that I need to mention to you. Uh, of course, Church Life Night is tonight at 6 p.m., and so we want to meet and have worship uh, together and, hear, and take care of some important business, and then uh, we'll fellowship together, chili dogs and chips, and then hopefully you guys have got your best homemade ice cream recipes ready to go in that freezer when you get home today, and you can bring those t tonight, and then we'll enjoy some ice cream together. And as Brother Chad said Wednesday night, Maybe you don't have an ice cream freezer, but you know where there's Bluebell, all right? <laughs> and bring that Bluebell. You know, Golden Brock is pretty good, too. So, yeah, either one, whichever's on sale, right? Uh, you can bring that tonight if you want to. Uh, we'll enjoy ice cream together out in the family center after we eat those hot dogs. I'll have Rolaids and Tums. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. But we're looking forward to having a great time tonight, so don't forget to come back, especially if you signed up, all right? 130 people signed up for tonight. So they're setting up chairs for 130 people, and I've got hot dogs for 130 people, so come uh, and eat, all right? And then uh, in, a, in a few weeks, in, in August already, uh, there's gonna, gonna be a ladies' coffee talk on August the 13th. Um, I believe that's a Saturday. And so it's, it's at 9.30 in the morning. The cost is $40. They're going to do a really neat wall-hanging craft. So check the sign-up sheet. There's more information about that. See Ms. Christie if you have any questions uh, about that. And so, yeah, but they need to know well in advance. So the lady that's, that's coming to do the presentation will have all of the things that she needs. So uh, right out there in the Connection Center, if you'd sign up, and you get to decide what you want to do. So there's a place up there to let them know which one you are going to want to do that day. So ladies, get together and you'll enjoy a great time uh, at the ladies' coffee talk. Next Sunday night, I'm backing up, I'm going all over the place. Next Sunday night is the Bog and Mission Chip Report. Uh, so remember that at 6 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. And then the last Sunday, uh, the farewell dinner for the Crosswells on the 31st. And you need to sign up this week for that, all right, so that we'll know how much barbecue to prepare prepare for that day all right so make sure you're signed up for that and then also last but certainly not least we're still raising funds uh, in July Operation Christmas Child so we're raising funds to help uh, facilitate that ministry so all this month if you'll just mark your gift Operation Christmas Child we'll see that it goes to that you're not gonna believe what I found in my cupboard last week uh, pantry I found a box of Little Debbie Christmas tree cakes. And then all of a sudden, we're raising funds for Operation Christmas Child. I thought, we ought to do a little, if we raise this much, you'll eat a Christmas tree cake from back in Christmas. It's like, used to, they do goldfish when raising, uh, raising funds. We had 100 in Sunday school, somebody's going to swallow goldfish, but that didn't, that didn't go over as well as I thought it would, but yeah. <laughs> Give to that worthy cause. It's going to bless kids, and you just wouldn't believe the testimonies. If you Google Operation Christmas Child testimonies, you'll come across some amazing stories of what this little shoebox full of gifts and goodies does when they receive it in another country somewhere far away. It's just amazing what God can do with little. All right? Little is much when God is in it, right? So we're looking forward to that. Let's pray, and then we'll continue on, and our worship Christie's going to come and sing. Father, thank you for this day you've given us to come and worship you, Lord. Help us to just focus on you in these moments, Lord, and to hear your spirit talk to us and touch us, Lord, and let us uh, experience the presence. Lord, we're so thankful for the presence and to be in your presence, Lord, and the comfort that comes from that. We lift up those on our prayer list, Lord. We lift up those who could not be here today. We pray for them. We ask you to be with our pastor as he brings the message. Lord, just touch our hearts with the word of God today. May we be encouraged as we leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen. situations that tug of war at me all 
day long I struggle for answers that I need. Then I come into his presence and all my questions become clear. And for that sacred moment, no doubt can interfere.
Let's sing that old hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. I've told you before, this is my favorite line of the hymn. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a Perfect. 
So good.
seated. You know, I think something that we probably all uh, deal with from time to time, um, perhaps even perhaps even today, is uh, we can feel discouraged. We can get to a point in our life where we just feel discouraged about how things are going. Perhaps we look around the world we're in, we see the situations that are taking place, we see things like Russia and Ukraine, we say, man, it's discouraging. Maybe we look at our nation, we look around, we see some things that are taking place, we say, man, it feels discouraging. Maybe even in our own personal life, it could be personal, it could be relational, it could be in terms of our family, perhaps professional. There can be some things that are going on that we just feel discouraged. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there right now. Uh, my pastor, when I was growing up, he, uh, he called discouragement, he called it the mully grubs. He said, you know, you get a case of the mully grubs. And, uh, I, you know, I think that uh, that's something that can happen to us from, from time to time. We can become discouraged. Well, three weeks ago, I preached to you a message. Uh, it was follow-up to Father's Day, but we were ending out uh, our family series. And I, I shared with you a message about Abraham being a father of faith. Now, Abraham's a remarkable man. His story is a remarkable story, a story of faith. As a matter of fact, we hold Abraham up as one of the heroes of the faith. We look at him, he's in, matter of fact, the message that I preached was in Hebrews chapter 11, which is the roll call of faith. It's the hall of fame of faith. And the majority of Hebrews chapter 11 is given uh, to, or the majority of, in terms of how much is written about one of the heroes of faith is written about Abraham. There's no doubt about it. Abraham was a great man of faith. Abraham was a man uh, that we look to as the father of faith. We look to him as a hero of faith. Of faith, and yet, as much as we herald Abraham as a great man of faith, and again, he was, there's no doubt about it that he was a man who struggled in his faith from time to time and had bouts of discouragement. Again, if there was ever a man who struggled with discouragement over how his life was progressing and over how things were not going as he believed, or how things were going the way he wanted, or how things were going as quickly as he would desire, it was Abraham. Abraham, 75 years old. His wife is 65 years old. They have no children. They live in the era of the Chaldees. I'm sure there's not a doubt in my mind that Abraham and Sarai wanted to have children. They did, but probably had come to a place in life, 75, 65, and said, you know, I just don't think it's going to happen, and we're okay with that. We've got a good life. We've been blessed. We have material possessions. We have a home. We have uh, people who work for us and work in you know, our enterprise, and, and uh, it's just the way it is. And yet, in that situation, God comes to Abraham and says, hey, man, you come to a land that I will show you. I'll give you the land, and I'll make a great name out of you, and I'm going to give you a nation. It's going to come through your loins. I'm going to give you a son. And Abraham says, man, I'm down with that. I want a son. I want to have a great name. I'm going to follow the Lord. And so he came. Abraham comes. And uh, I can just imagine that when Abraham shows up, he's probably thinking, you know, I'm here. But where's the son? A year passes by. 
It's longer than nine months. I don't have a kid. Two years passes by. Five years passes by. Ten years pass by. And he still doesn't have a son. I can only imagine as he's followed God's will, as he's followed the call of God, as he's come and he's listened to the promise of God, I'll give you a son that he's got to be thinking. I don't know if this thing is going to work out the way I imagined it. I'm just not sure, right? We looked at this a few weeks ago. The how, I don't know how God's going to do it. I don't know the when that God is going to do it. I'm 10 years in and it still hasn't happened. And that's what we find in Genesis chapter 15. Abraham is 10 years in, and he does not yet have the son. I can see in Abraham a sense of discouragement because things haven't happened that perhaps he thinks should already have happened. Discouragement. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 15 today. Discouragement. I, I, I want to preach today on the topic of discouragement because discouragement, I believe this, discouragement in the hands of the devil is a powerful tool. Discouragement in the hands of the devil is a powerful tool. It's a powerful tool for tearing us down. It's a powerful tool for uh, helping to dismantle our faith. It's a powerful tool for helping to separate us from God. It can be a powerful tool for helping to separate people from one another, even people from a church. Think about this. How many marriages have fallen apart because someone in the marriage became discouraged? Both people became discouraged, and off they went. How many times have uh, people in their life become destroyed or torn down because of discouragement? How many times have People in a church walked away from faith, walked away from God, walked away from relationships, walked away from a church because something happened that they became discouraged. And discouragement as a tool in the hand of our enemy is a powerful tool. Listen, he's out to destroy us, okay? He's out to tear us down. And I think discouragement is one of the most powerful, one of the most effective weapons that he has. And I think that Satan probably was taking some jabs at old Abraham too. Can I separate him from his faith? Can I separate him out from his belief in what God wants to do in his life? And I think God was looking down at Abraham too. I think God was looking at Abraham who is now 85 years old and he's looking and Abraham has got some fear in his life. Abraham has some dismay in his life. Abraham has some concerns in his life. And Abraham needs some reassurance. Abraham needs some encouragement. And in Genesis chapter 15, God shows up and does just that. And inside this passage of Scripture, there are some things, if we'll look at it here, there are some things that we can take, we can apply in our life in those times that we find ourselves in need of some encouragement, in need of some reassurance, in need of some uplifting. That may be today for you. And if it is today for you, I want to encourage you. There are three things we're going to look at today. There are three things that you can do to encourage yourself in the Lord. And we can choose to be encouraged. I want to share with you this morning a message entitled, be encouraged. If you have your Bibles, we're in Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, we're going to look here at most of this chapter, the story of Abraham. If you would stand with me, we'll honor the reading of God's Word. Genesis chapter 15, we're going to begin in verse number 1. We'll read down through verse number 18. And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing that I go childless? And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be your heir, but he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. And he brought him forth and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And Abraham believed the Lord. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. And, and he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the earth of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And Abraham said unto the Lord, Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all of these, and he divided them, that is, he cut them down the middle, and he laid them side by side, each piece against another, but the birds he divided not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. 
And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And God said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and shall afflict them for four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge afterward, and they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go unto your fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. <clears throat> for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And in that same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Let's pray. Fathers, we come to you today. Lord, here's our prayer. God, would you help us today? Or would you help us to put our focus, Lord, upon you? Lord, we've had a sweet time of worship where we've talked about, saying about the presence of Jehovah. God, today, would you help us to know this? You're always with us. Or we can choose, Lord, to find our encouragement. We focus, Lord, upon your presence. Or today, as we see these things that you do in Abram's life to encourage him, God, may we find ourselves doing these things. Lord, we want to be encouraged. Lord, we want to be encouraged in what you're doing in our life, what you're doing in our church, Lord, what you're doing through us. Lord, I pray today there be someone here today who finds themselves with a case of the mully grubs, Lord, a case of being dismayed, downtrodden, disheartened, Lord. Lord, may we look to these things today, take them, use them, apply them in our lives. Or we may find ourselves in some place in the future where we're discouraged. Lord, may we remember these things. May we look to the life of Abraham and these, these principles, Lord, that are being taught today. May we take them, may we use them. Lord, we want to give you the glory. We want to give you the honor. We want to give you the praise today. We ask God, may you let your presence abide here today. May we worship you. May we hear from you, God. May our lives be changed by you today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. I want to share with you three things here. Number one, hey, be encouraged. How? By focusing on the presence of God. In verse number one, it says that Abraham, hey, he was fearful. He was fearful of some things. So listen, he's 85 years old. The promise hasn't come about. And I think that we can sense here that Abraham is becoming discouraged. He's becoming discouraged with how quickly things are supposed to happen that aren't happening. And I think God senses that too. In verse number one, God shows up. God comes to Abram in a vision. God encourages him. I want you to think about that. When Abram is discouraged, God shows up. How awesome is that? When Abram is discouraged, God shows up in his life. Now, the Bible says that he shows up in a vision. The presence of God is manifested to him. I believe that Abram is discouraged. God wants to, to come to him and encourage him, and he does. He tells him, don't fear. I want to tell you that when we become discouraged, whether in life in general or with something specific in our relationships or with our job or with whatever it might be, that when we, maybe we feel a lack of God working in our life. Maybe we're asking the same questions that Abram is asking. Where is God? When is God? This is the time that we need to choose to focus on God, to focus on His presence. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this, that when we lack a focus on God, when we lack a focus on God's presence, we can actually fall into a place of discouragement. So let us put our focus upon God. Here's the truth. God is always with us. He's always with us. And so the question is, are we focusing on that reality? When I say that he's always with us, I'm telling you he's always with us in a much greater way than he's with Abraham. And I realize I just read to you that God showed up in a, in a vision. You might be thinking, man, I'd love that. I'd love for God to show up in a vision, in a dream, speak to me. How cool would that be? I'm telling you, as a believer, you have something way, way better than God showing up in a vision or in a dream. Listen, we have the Holy Spirit of God who lives within us. Jesus said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He said, lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. We have 24-7 access to God through the finished work of Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Listen, we have God with us, in us. The question is, but do we take time to focus on that 
reality. When we find ourselves discouraged, we can choose to be encouraged by God by focusing on his presence. I want you to see these four things for Abraham. When I choose to focus on God's presence, note this, number one, God becomes the source of my courage. God becomes the source of my courage. Listen, God shows up, his presence shows up in Abraham's life, and he says to Abram, hey, don't be afraid. He speaks here, fear not. Fear and discouragement and dismay and uneasiness, all of these things kind of work together like partners in crime, right? Almost invariably, you find someone who's discouraged, you'll find someone who is fearful. Someone who is fearful, someone who is uneasy. Someone who is uneasy, someone who is dismayed. These things all kind of just work together like partners in crime. They work well together, but I don't mean necessarily in a good way. Think about what God said to Joshua following the death of Moses. He shows up in Joshua's life. Chapter 1, verse 9, the book of Joshua, he says, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Why? Because the Lord thy God is with you whithersoever thou goest. Hey, don't be discouraged. Why? Because God's with you. Hey, don't be dismayed. Why? Because God's with you. Hey, don't be uneasy. Why? Because God is with you. 366 times in God's word is this command, fear not. I, was, I heard a preacher one time say this, 366 times, we're reminded by God, don't fear. 366 times we're commanded by God, fear not. One command for every day of the year, including leap year. Man, it's all throughout God's word. Don't fear, fear not. Why? Because... I am with you. The command to fear not is a reminder. God is with us. You read a comic book on Superman. Someone's in need. Superman shows up. He says, have no fear. Superman is here. Friend, I'm telling you, we've got something way better than a comic book hero. We have God And he says, fear not. Why? Because I am with you. David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Here's what I'm telling you. Today, you might find yourself struggling with some discouragement. There might be some things happening in your life. Could be financial, could be medical, could be health-related, could be relational, could be personal. Again, could be on the world stage, the national stage. Makes no difference. But whatever it is that you may find yourself struggling with, here's my uh, uh, exhortation to you. Focus on the presence of God. Why? Number one, because he is the source of our courage. You know what courage is? When you put in courage, you get encouraged. He's the source of our courage. And number two, when we focus on God, we understand this, that God knows my needs. God knows my needs. I want you to note here in verse one, God shows up and he says, fear not. Abram. He knows exactly what the need of Abraham is. He shows up, he says, fear not. Not only does he know the need, but he knows Abram personally. He calls him by name. Friend, I want to tell you today that God not only knows your need, he knows you. And he knows you better than anyone else in the universe. Matter of fact, he knows you better than you. No, you. Matthew 10 and verse 30 says, God knows the very number of hairs on our head. Matthew 6 and verse 8, Jesus said, God knows your need before you even ask it of him. What a source of comfort. In those times when we feel discouraged, we can take courage in knowing this. We are not lost to God. Sometimes, friend, listen to me. Sometimes God is lost to us. Our focus isn't on God. We're not focusing on God. We don't even know that God is around, and he's right here. He's with us. He's around us. We may, God may be lost to us, but listen, friend, but you are never lost to God. You are never like off his radar screen. There's nothing that happens in your life that God's caught by surprise. You never come to God with a need, and he's like, I am so glad that you brought that to my attention because I had no awareness of that whatsoever. Listen, God knows and I'm telling you it is a comfort to us to know that we serve a God who knows our need and he not only knows our need but he knows 
me. He knows you. He knew Abraham's need. He shows up. Fear not, Abram. God knows our needs. See, when I focus on God, I understand he's the source of my courage. I understand that he knows me. He knows my need. Not only that, but watch this. When I focus on God, I understand something about God. Abraham's going to get clued into. God says this in verse 1. He says, Abraham, fear not, for I am your shield. God is my protection. Abraham, I am your shield. You know what a shield does? A shield guards. It protects. It defends. And God's saying something to Abraham here. Hey, Abraham, I'm going to protect you. Abraham, I'm going to defend you. Now think about what that means. God shields us. He protects us. He guards us. He defends us against the enemy's attack. And I think most of us, we, we really understand the idea that God can protect us. And probably, I'm telling you, if you're a parent in your life, you have prayed for God's protection for your kid. Your kid gets in that car and drives away. You're like, oh God, just give protection as they travel down the road. Give safety to and fro. Right? We pray, we say, hey God, you brought us here. Send us home safely. And we think about the idea of physical safety, physical protection. You know what Jesus said, you know, in that Lord's Prayer, the model prayer? He said, and deliver them, what? From evil. Deliver from the evil one. Spiritual protection. And there's this sense in which, which God protects us. Not only physically, and he can, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. He can protect us. And I think in this moment where, where Abraham is fearful, where Abraham is maybe concerned about is this thing going to really happen? I mean, it's been 10 years, right? He's concerned about the son that has not come. God shows up and says, don't fear, man. Don't fear. Oh, and I'm your shield. I'm going to protect you from the evil one. Because I'm telling you, discouragement in the hand of the devil is a powerful tool to bring destruction and chaos into our life. God is a shield this was one of David's favorite descriptions or monikers for God. In the Psalms, he calls God a shield over a dozen times, but that idea of being a defense, a bulwark, he calls him a shield, a buckler, a refuge, a strong tower. God is a place of protection. He is a place of defense. Yes, physically, but I mean spiritually. Number four, when I focus on God, I not only understand that he's the source of my courage. I not only understand that he knows my need and he knows me. I understand this, that he's not only my protection. But number four, he says this, And Abraham, I am your exceeding great reward. Hey, Abraham, I am your prize. God is my prize. You think about that, man, what a prize. The supreme prize that we can have, the supreme prize that Abram could have was a relationship with God. There was nothing greater. Hey, Abram, you want a son. I've promised you a son. Hey, Abram, I'm going to bring you a son. Hey, and when you get that son, Abram, you're going to say, what a prize. What a reward of, of my faith and trust in God. But you know, what, you know what God wants Abraham to know, though? But greater than a son, greater than a piece of land, is a relationship with me. Friend, listen to me. The greatest reward the greatest prize that we'll ever have in this life or in the life to come is a relationship with God. It's not a blessing that we can get a hold of. It's not, it's not a, 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 a fame, a, a, a name that we can make for ourselves. It's not some physical possession. And when we get to eternity, it won't be, hey, I got a mansion, right? On the hill. Hey, I got a cabin on the backside of glory, and it's, 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 it's what God's... No, it will be this, that we will have a relationship with God for all eternity. When I preached about Abraham, I said this, that his hope was not in this world, but in the world to come. And we said this, that there's a new heaven and a new earth that's coming down. There's going to be healed relationships. And God said, and I will dwell with them, and they will dwell with me. I will be their God. He's talking about us. There's going to be uh, 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 a... Uh, unfettered and a, a, a unseparated uh, union, okay, between us and God. That's going to be the greatest thing for all eternity, and it's the greatest thing now, too. See, when I focus on God, I understand something. 
God is my greatest reward. God is my great prize. That's what he's trying to get across to Abram. In his time of discouragement, hey man, don't be discouraged. Look at what you already have. The source of his courage. God knows his need. He knows his name. He's a shield, a protection. And he is Abram's great reward. When we find ourselves discouraged, let us, number one, focus on the presence of God. When I choose to focus on the presence of God, I choose to be encouraged. Number two, be encouraged. How? By believing in the promise of God. Perhaps the source of Abraham's discouragement, and I would say it is, the source of his uneasiness, the source of his fear, was simply the fact that he had not yet received the blessing that God had promised to him, and that was the blessing of a son. God had promised him, Abram, I'm going to give you a land. Abram, I'm going to make a name out of you. Abram, I'm going to make a nation out of you. Abram, in order to do that, I'm going to give you a son. And now we get down to verse 2 and 3, and Abram's looking around and says, Okay, God, I mean, I hear you. You're here, right? But Lord, listen to what he says. But Lord, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. He said, Look, you've not given me any offspring. And indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Basically, what Abram is saying is, God, what's your plan? What's your plan? Abraham is fearful that God will fulfill his promise by letting his chief servant, Eliezer, be his heir, which was an acceptable practice in Abraham's day. Hey, I don't have any kids, but I've got a servant who was born in my household, and so he's kind of like a a surrogate son, and uh, when I die, uh, the inheritance goes to him. So is God saying, I'm going to let you have a nation through Eliezer? He's, he's, he's asking some questions. He's expressing his doubt. He's expressing his concern. Let that sink in. He's expressing his doubt. He's expressing his concerns. He's asking God, is this the way the plan is going to work? And I say that to you today to say this. That if you find yourself discouraged, it's all right to show your concern to God. God, is this it? God, is this what you have in store? God, is this what's cooking? Is this the way it's going to be? Now watch what happens. God doesn't criticize Abram. God doesn't belittle Abram. God doesn't judge Abram. He doesn't say, hey man. He doesn't crank on him, right? He doesn't scream at him. He just, all right, I hear you, man. I hear you. And then God comes back and he doubles down. No, nope. This one, Eliezer, will not be your heir, but one that comes from your own bowels. I'm going to fulfill my promise, Abram, and I'm going to do it in my timing, but here's what you can count on. The promise is going to come true. Friend, we need to understand something. Sometimes God's promises, they're long-term. They're for the long haul. But you can count on this, no matter how long term, no matter how long time it may be, you can count on this. God's coming through with every promise that he's ever made. God said, hey, I'm coming through, Abram. You can count on this. I'm asking you, Abram, to do this. You want to be encouraged, Abram? Focus on my presence. You want to be encouraged, Abram? Believe my promise. So here's what he says. Hey, Abram, I'm coming through for you, all right? Now, I want you to step outside your tent door and I want you to look up into the sky and tell me what you see. Abram's looking into the Milky Way galaxy. Now, I'm telling you, upon any given night, if I said, come up here to the church, we're going to stand out in the parking lot, we're going to look up into the sky, I'm going to tell you that you would not see the same thing that Abram saw. You can see the North Star, you can see the Big Dipper, you can see the Little Dipper, you can see the Seven Sisters, you can see a few things. But because of light pollution... You're not going to see what Abram saw. But if you've ever been in a situation of dark skies, moon's not shining, no light pollution, and you look up into the sky from horizon to horizon, it's nothing but a kajillion stars. I mean, it is mind-boggling, and it is beautiful. And when Abraham looked up, that's what he saw. From horizon to horizon, he saw a kajillion stars. Now, I don't know... 
if Abraham could count to a kajillion or not, but it's going to take him a while to get there. And God says, can you number the stars? Because whatever it is, that's how many descendants you're going to have that will be issued out of your own bowels. You know what he's saying? I'm telling you, Abram, I'm coming through on my promises. And you know what the Bible says? And Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Verse number 6 is one of the single most important verses in all the Word of God because it tells us plainly that Abram's faith was counted to be righteousness before God. Friend, listen to me. That's the way of salvation. Our salvation is by faith, not by works, not by anything that we do, not by religion, not by ceremony, but by faith. God looked at the faith of Abraham. God revealed something to Abraham. He said, Abraham, this is what I'm going to do. Abraham put his faith in what God revealed to him. And God said, I count that faith as being righteous. Not Abraham, you're righteous, but your faith, I'm counting it as righteousness. I'm putting it to your account that way. That's what God does for us. You know what God has revealed to us? That his son, Jesus Christ, is God robed in the flesh, that he has stepped into this world, that he has lived a perfect life, that he fulfilled the law, that he took all of our sin, all of our guilt, was accounted to him. He died for it, paid for it, was buried and raised again. And if you will put your faith, your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, God says, I'll count your faith as righteousness. You're not righteous, but I count your faith as being righteous. That's justification. God does something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. We're not saved by works, by merit, by ceremony. We're not saved by the law. We're not saved by keeping the law. We're not saved by seeking to keep the law. Think about this. Abraham's faith was counted as righteousness 400 plus years before the law ever came into existence. He couldn't be saved by the law. It didn't even exist. And his faith was counted as righteousness before circumcision came on the scene because he won't be circumcised until later in his story. So no ceremonial right, no ceremonial law. Abraham was saved how? By grace, through faith. That's how we're saved. Now here's what I want you to know. If in your life you have trusted God with your greatest need, the need of salvation. If you've trusted him that his promise is sure, hey, I have promised you, you put your faith, you put your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, I promise you I will count your faith as righteousness and save you. If we've done that, if we've trusted God with our greatest need, then wherever we are in life, whatever it is that we may be discouraged about, We can trust him with every promise. Here's what I'm saying. If we can trust him with the greatest promise, we can trust him with every promise. The Bible has over 2,500 promises in it. Not every one of those promises is for you, okay? Some of those promises are very specific and to specific individuals. They don't apply to us. They're not for us. There are some promises in God's word, though, that are uh, uh, conditioned promises, You do, and I promise I'll fulfill. There are other promises in God's Word that are unconditional. But whether they're specific promises to individual, whether they're conditional promises, or whether they're unconditional promises, this is what I want you to know. God's coming through on every promise. Not one is going to be dropped. My encouragement to you is that when you find those promises in God's Word that apply in your life, just know this. Whether it's a long time, whether it's over the long haul, whether it's a long term, or whether it's a short term, if you as a child of God have trusted that God came through on this promise, you trust Jesus, I'll count your faith as righteousness. If you've done that, then you know this, I can trust God with every promise. God says, you want to be encouraged? Abram, focus on my presence. Abram, you want to be, you want to be encouraged? Believe my promises. And then number three, Abram, trust my plan. How can we be encouraged? Number three, by trusting God's plans. Sometimes the plans of God can be hard to see. You know that. Every one of us in this room at times has been like, man, 
I'm just struggling to know what the will of God is and exactly how God's plan is going to unfold in my life. There are things that have occurred. I'm just not sure how things are going. Sometimes the plan of God is hard to see. It can be hard to comprehend. It can be hard to trust. And that's when we need to focus on God's presence and believe in God's promises. Jack Graham, who is the uh, pastor of uh, Prestonwood Baptist Church over in Plano, Texas, tells his story. He talks about in his life how God called him to preach. And then God called him to pastor. And he was preaching revival. I think it was over in the state of Oklahoma. He was preaching revival and revival services, and things were going great. Things were going good. He got a phone call from his brother that his dad had been murdered. His dad had been bludgeoned to death by uh, a, a criminal assailant. And Jack tells a story. He talks about this. He says, man, I, I, I couldn't understand that. I couldn't fathom that. I couldn't understand how that was working in God's plan. God had called me to preach. I surrendered to preach. God had called me to pastor. I was pastoring. I mean, things were going great. My ministry was going well. God was blessing. God was doing great things. And yet here's my dad, who I love tremendously. Here's, here's this great thing that was taking place. And now he's gone. And here's what he said. These are the words of Jack Graham. He said, I couldn't see the plan of God. In those times when I couldn't see the plan of God, he said, it was dark. It was dark in my life at that time, but I knew that I could trust in God's presence and trust in his promises. Now, I want to tell you something. That's exactly what I've been preaching. Point number one was trust in the presence of God, right? Focus on the presence of God. Point number two was believe in the promises. Jack Graham said this, when I couldn't understand the plan of God for my life. I knew this though. I could trust in his presence and I could trust in his promises. You know what Jack Graham found in doing that? Found encouragement. But he also found this out. If I can trust in the presence of God, if I can trust in the promises of God, I can trust the plan of God. Even when it's hard to comprehend, I can trust that God's unfolding his plan. Abram, after he looks out at the stars, and he says, I believe, right? God's the one who said that he believed, right? He counted his faith, his righteousness. Abraham will now turn around, though, and say, well, how will I know? Now, he just, God just said he believed. But he turns right around and he says, but how will I know that I'll inherit the land? That my offspring will inherit the land? And God reiterates that it will happen. He tells him it's going to happen. And then he says, I'll tell you what, Abram. You bring a three-year-old heifer. You bring a, a goat, a ram, a pigeon, and a dove. Now, when God told him to bring that stuff, he knew exactly what God was asking him to do. If God told me and you to bring a heifer, a goat, we said, why? You know, what, what's it for? You know, what's this about? But Abram understands exactly what God's asking him to do. He takes the heifer, splits it in half. He takes the ram, splits it in half. He takes the goat, he splits it in half. And then he takes the pieces and he lays them out. And he takes the pieces and he lays them out. He's connecting the pieces. He takes the pieces and he lays them out. And then he takes the pigeon, puts on one side. He takes the dove and he puts it on the other. What Abraham is doing in his lifetime is known as a blood covenant. Now, in our world today, when we think about covenants, we think about a contract. Hey, you sign, I sign. That's the end of it, right? We made an agreement. We legally signed something. Or before contracts became big, what do people do? Shake on it. Put your name, you put your word, you put forth, you shook on it, man. That's the end of it right there. In Abram's day, men entered into covenants. And the blood covenant was perhaps the strongest covenant statement that could be made. Because what the two people were saying, they take the animals, they lay them open, then they made a promise to one another, they held hands, and side by side they both walked in between the carcasses the pieces of the animals. And here's what they're saying. If I break my promise to you, let what's happened to these animals happen to me. 
It's blood covenant. It's in the own penalty of death. You know what you're saying, man? I believe you, man. Right, right? I mean, if you're wanting to, to believe someone, say, hey, on penalty of death. And so Abraham takes the, these animals, splits them, lays them open. And then, do you remember how we read the story? It said, and then a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Lo, darkness and a great horror. Now, that's not like a horror film. Right? Like he wasn't afraid. He wasn't scared. It just means, man, he was stone cold, knocked out. He was in a, like a state of being paralyzed. I mean, he was like in that deep sleep where someone comes and knocks on the door, rings your doorbell, and you're like, I never knew you came. I never heard the doorbell ring. I never heard the phone ring. You're like, you're just zonked out. I mean, he's in a deep sleep. And then it says, a smoking pot and a lamp show up. That smoking furnace is a picture of God's judgment. That lamp is a picture of the light of God. This is God. And I want you to note that God speaks to Abraham and he makes some promises to Abraham. And then God, and only God, marches through between those pieces of those animals. Abraham makes no promises to God. He can't. He's stone cold knocked out. He's zonked out. He's asleep on the ground. God speaks. God makes all the promises. And God walks through. He marches through between those animals. You know what God's saying? Abram, if I break my promise, let what's happened to these animals happen to me. God enters into an unconditional, one-sided covenant with Abraham. It is unconditional. It is unbreakable. It is un alterable. You know what God has done for us? Through the cross of Calvary, he's made a blood covenant. He's made a blood covenant with his children through the cross of Calvary. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 13, the Bible says, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself saying, surely I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after Abraham had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. So here it is, right? Hey, let's enter into an oath. Let's enter into an agreement. Let's enter into a blood covenant. Okay, done. I trust you. I believe you. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it with an oath. What's the oath he's referencing? It's the cross. It's the new covenant. Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 and 9 says, In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. You say, man, what does that mean? The gospel was preached unto Abraham? I mean, what does that mean? That it was that in the seed all nations would be blessed. The seed is Jesus Christ. And we're blessed with Abraham by faith. You think, how does that happen? Well, God made a covenant. It's called the New Covenant. And the New Covenant was sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, friend? We were just like Abraham, paralyzed in our sin, stone cold, knocked out. We could not come to God on our own. Couldn't make it happen. God came to us. God came to us. Jesus Christ, the Son of God incarnate, came to us. He's made a covenant. He's established the covenant, and he sealed the covenant by his own blood. Here's what I'm telling you. Salvation is a one-sided, unconditional covenant. God makes all the promises. You don't make promises to God. God makes all the promises to you. All of the conditions for holding the covenant are on God. That's why when it comes to you, you cannot break it, you cannot change it, you cannot shake it. And guess what? Neither will God. Why? Because he is unchanging. He says, whereby to show the immutability, the unchangingness of God, he confirmed it by an oath. Friend, when you put your faith, you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you enter into a blood covenant 
with God. All of the promises are from God to you. And all of the benefits of the covenant are yours. The benefits are eternal life, the forgiveness of sin, the promise of heaven, the security of salvation permanently and unconditionally because of the one who made the promise. You didn't make the promise. When you get saved, you cannot make a promise. It is God who makes the promises, and his promises are sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Get this truth. God is absolutely, totally committed to his children. The covenant that he has made with his children is unshakable, unbreakable. It is unalterable. I bring that up to simply say this, that when you encounter difficult times, when you find it difficult to trust in the plan that God is working out in your life, look to the covenant relationship that you have with him. It's one-sided. It's unconditional. He has swore it by an oath. Jesus has shed his blood. And if we can trust God with our salvation, we can trust him with anything. No matter what it is that you may be experiencing today, no matter what difficulty, what trial, what hardship, what discouragement, what may have you in the mully grubs, I want you to know this, that if you can trust God with the salvation of your life, your soul, you can trust God with anything. And if there's anything that encourages us, it's this. That God not only has my eternity covered, but he's got my present covered too. When things are dark, when things are hard to see, and I find myself discouraged, here's the point. I can choose to be encouraged by choosing to focus on God, believe in his promises, and trust his plan. Here's the bottom line. I'm encouraged when I choose to focus on God's presence, believe in God's promise, and trust in his plan for my life. The God of Abraham is the same God today that he was then. He does not change. He has not diminished. He's the same God. And the God that, that you trusted in when you got saved, the God that you trusted in that saved you, that brought you into a covenant relationship with him, he has not changed. And I want to encourage you today. If you find yourself in a place of discouragement in your journey of faith, and that's what God's called us to, to journey in faith with him. He called Abraham to journey in faith with him, and yet Abraham found himself in a place of discouragement. And sometimes we may find ourselves too in a place of discouragement. And if you do, be encouraged. Focus on his presence. Believe in his promises. Trust in his plan. Friend, today I may be speaking to someone today. Hey, you're saved. You know that you're saved. But right now, in this moment, there is something in your life that is discouraging you. This altar is open to you. This is a time to say, God, I'm coming to you, right? Hey, I know this. I'm going to focus on your presence. You're the source of my courage. You know my need. You know my name. You are my shield, my protection, and you are my great, exceeding reward. God, I want to find encouragement in you. I think God's children should be encouraged. I hope today that you'll put your focus on God's presence in your life. But you may be here today, though, You've never put your faith, your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You never have. And yet you look at your life today and there's something in your life that you're discouraged about. Can I just exhort you today? Whatever it is, and I'm not minimizing, I'm not, but I'll tell you this. The greatest need of your life is salvation. It's greater than whatever hardship you have financially, greater than any difficulty that you have relationally on earth, greater than any mully grubs that you may be going through. The greatest need of your life is salvation. And you can't come to God on your own. You can't earn your salvation. You can't go through some ceremonial rite. You can't go through some religion. But you can have a relationship with God through the finished work of Jesus Christ. When we're stone cold knocked out in our sin, we cannot do anything on our own to save ourselves. God came to us. He's made every provision. And here's what he's saying. Do you trust me? Hey, Abraham, do you trust me? I do. And your faith is counted as righteousness. When we choose to trust what God has revealed to us, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came into this world. He 
He's perfect. He's the incarnate God. He came as the God-man. He came in our nature so that he could die in our place. He took all of our guilt on the cross. If I look to God and I say, I'm trusting in that. I'm not trusting me. I'm not trusting church. I'm not trusting in religion. I'm not trusting in ceremony. I'm not trusting in baptism. I'm not trusting in some uh, religion. I'm trusting in Jesus and what Jesus did for me. God says, I count that faith as righteousness. You're not righteous, but I count your faith as righteousness. And we enter into a personal relationship with God through Jesus' finished work. A blood covenant, unconditional, unchangeable, unalterable, unshakable by anything that we may do. The promises are not on us. The promises are on him. And praise God for that. Because if I had to keep even one promise, I'd be doomed. And so would you. This morning, if you find yourself in a place of discouragement, the altar is open. If you find yourself in a place in the need of salvation, we invite you to come. I'm going to have you stand this morning. We're going to have this hymn of invitation. If you need to be saved, would you come today? Would you put your faith in Jesus and his finished work? Again, this altar is open to you. Would you come find your focus on the presence of God? He's the source of your courage. He knows your need. He knows your name. He's the shield of protection. He is the great, exceeding reward. May we be encouraged by who he is in our lives today. Brother Randy, as you lead us in this hymn of invitation, I'm inviting you to come this morning. As we sing, you come.